What's up, Navigating Academia family? This is Dr. J. Phoenix Singh. I hope you're having a great day so far. Appreciate you stopping by. Before we get to today's valued viewers question, do me a big favor and smash that like button. It's totally free for you. It helps our little channel grow. We're growing at a really solid pace right now. I wanna keep that going. So you can do me a huge favor by doing that. Today's question is from Curtis. So Curtis, thank you so much for watching. You have very kind words, mate. I really appreciate that. So let's go ahead and read Curtis's question then we'll get right into it, okay? Here we go. So Curtis writes, I'm a senior undergraduate at UNC Chapel Hill, go Tar Heels. Uh, I am a double major in psychology and interdisciplinary studies focused in psychosocial determinants of crime. I am passionate about clinical forensic psychology and want to pursue my PhD in that area. I found your channel in search of a platform that explained the process of applying to undergrad, sorry, applying to graduate school. Uh, currently, I'm curious about clinical psychology programs with a forensic emphasis and how to really foster that focus within a clinical program. Okay, so we got several questions here from Curtis, okay? So that's number one. Second one is, how do you start a lab at an institution as a professor? And the third one is, and forensic psychology related opportunities to explore in gap years. Okay, so let's hit all three of those, okay? So first one, Curtis, uh, your best friend is gonna be Division 41 of uh, American Psychological Association. It is called the American Psychology Law Society. It's a great group of people. Basically, if you're a forensic psychologist in the United States, that's where you wanna be, that's where you wanna go. If you wanna have an annual conference, that's the one you should go to at least at the national level. There are many different reasons to go to local conferences, regional conferences, national and international conferences. Those are kind of the four big levels. APLS in the U.S. is a great place to start. A lot of the people who presumably are going to become your heroes when you're reading that literature, especially contemporary literature in that field, if they're still alive, which hopefully they are, that's where they're going to be. So that's the place that I would recommend you going. There, you know, these conferences are a dime a dozen in forensic psych, it's the exact same thing. And yes, there are conferences in forensic psychology and in forensic psychiatry and in forensic nursing and in forensic counseling and in forensic social work. But for forensic psychology domestically, that is the place that I want you to go, okay? Now, if you go on to Google and you just type in something along the lines of, it's like, so APLS, so do AP hyphen LS, so APLS graduate school programs, okay? There's going to be a PDF, and they release the PDF usually once a year, sometimes they skip a year or whatever, but literally they keep a an ongoing contemporary list of every doctoral level, uh, like APA approved, accredited program in clinical forensic psychology. That's where you want to be. That's where you want to look at. That is your go-to resource. It is better than anything else that is out there, okay? So that is what I recommend to you. If that's the area that you're interested in, that's what I want you to do, okay? Always remember that at the end of the day, if you want to do a clinical forensic psychology program, that the only thing that matters, and I'm talking about PhD here, not PsyD, the only thing that matters is who your doctoral supervisor is. If you go to a really big name university and nobody has any idea who your supervisor is, you're wasting your time, okay? Uh, what I want you to do is to focus on who the supervisor is. In academia, whoever the supervisor is, is the person who is the gateway to the rest of your career. If they don't know anyone, it's a problem. If they don't publish a lot in journals that are in the field you wanna end up in, that's a problem. So you need to be really, really picky, okay? in terms of making that determination. Make sure you know the literature obscenely well in terms of the specific sub-literature that you wanna be in. Don't just say something along the lines of, oh, I wanna work with prisoners and I wanna do clinical evaluations of psychopathy. It's nowhere near enough, right? You're getting close with psychopathy and you're getting close with saying psychopathy in an, in, you know, in an actual like correctional, like internal setting, not community corrections. You want to be in a prison, in a jail, so not probation, parole. Okay, even better. It's like, okay, but what do you want to do there? And you say, well, I want to evaluate psychopathy. It's like, okay, well, there's dozens of instruments out there that are designed to evaluate psychopathy. So what facet of psychopathy do you want to be looking at? What phenomenon? What subpopulation? These are the kinds of things that the only way you can sufficiently drill down is getting to know the literature. And once you find people who over the past three to five years have been publishing that literature, you're going to come up with kind of a really nice microcosm of professionals that you want to work with. And these individuals usually are concentrated in a small amount of schools in the United States. So these are schools with, you know, forensic programs like Drexel or John Jay or Sam Houston State, uh, UC Irvine, University of Alabama, there's a University of North Texas, you know, these sorts of places are the places you'd want to be. Not the Harvards or anything like this, right? Those 
Those are not the programs for forensic psychology. Are there one or two forensic psychologists in a lot of clinical programs? Yeah, usually. But if you want something with a clinical emphasis, like a clinical, sorry, not a clinical emphasis, a forensic emphasis, a forensic track, you need to pick one where that's really well established, okay? And where there are operating labs. And that leads to your second question, which is how do you start a lab at an institution as a professor? Okay, well, first and foremost, usually when you end up, if you are at an institution that expects you to do research, if you are new, usually what ends up happening is that you will either join the lab of somebody who is senior, work with them, and eventually kind of branch off. So you're kind of cutting your teeth on the lab of somebody else uh, until you have the time to be able to apply for grants and get grant money because you need money right? Usually you need money. There's two options here. I can tell you both. The first is that you need to go out and get some soft money. Okay. Soft money is like grant money or whatever. Uh, it is money that is not associated with kind of, let's say uh, tuition of, uh, of students at your institution. Sometimes when you first join as a faculty member, you can negotiate a lab stipend. So money that the department will give you or the university will give you to be able to start your lab, but it's not going to be like 50,000, a hundred thousand dollars, right? Maybe you'll get like 10 grand or something like this or less. That is all over the place. I have heard all sorts of numbers, okay? Usually smaller numbers, unless you have external funding, because the external funding is going to help you uh, take on more grad students, take on postdocs, hire, you know, external consultants, so on and so forth, and, you know, build that team, and then the lab will be built. You always have to have a cutesy schmootsy name, and you always have to have a cutesy schmootsy acronym. If you don't have those, People don't take it seriously. So for example, like I was at the IPC lab, nice and tight, and IPC was interpersonal perception and communication, right? Uh, I remember I came up with, you know, I'm in forensic psychology and, uh, you know, I always joke around. I say, if I were to come up with a risk assessment tool, it would be the dynamic risk screening instrument for negative grievous harm, including sadistic activities without engaging in, what is it, masochistic events. And the acronym for all of that is Dr. Singh is awesome. So there you go, right? You got to have a cute acronym, absolutely critical. So so that's really how you start a lab if you've got money and it does send around money. What if you don't have money? Okay, well, that's fine too. If you don't have money, you can still start a lab and that may sound fancy, but it may just be like your office or it may be, you know, part of like a shared like a large room or something like this, you know, very rarely is it going to, rarely is going to be a wet lab where you're wearing a white coat and all these sorts of things, right? Like that's not really what we do in forensic psychology per se. But it's definitely the case where there are different methodologies where you need minimal to no money and you can do a lot of good stuff. So for example, surveys, systematic reviews, meta-analyses uh, are just a few examples. Secondary data analysis, where you take the data of somebody else, you do new analyses, especially these days when it comes to open data, which is part of open science. I mean, there are so many repositories of open data out there where you can find data and then actually do your research, publish on it, okay? Uh, so these are all ways where you can cut down costs and still essentially set your lab up, okay? But let's put it this way, mate. It sounds really fancy to have a lab. It's really not that big of a deal, though. It is what it is. Uh, remember, the unit of currency in academia period is basically perceived respect, not actual respect, not if people actually respect you. It is the perception of respect. And so, which is ridiculous, but it's also true. So welcome to the channel. <laughs> if you haven't watched that many Curtis, I just shoot you straight, which is true. A lot of people get caught up in the rat race of academia, trying to like get a bigger name in these things without re remembering or realizing that no one cares. No one cares, right? But it's that perception that you're making a difference as opposed to the reality of it. I want you to always make sure, Curtis, that you're staying really grounded and recognizing that the much more important thing here is to give back to com your community, care about your family, treat other people well, and that is so much more important than getting 10 publications a year. It just is, okay? So in any case, because it's easy to get caught up in the rat race. Your last question is, and forensic psychology related opportunities to explore in gap years. Okay, so uh, in terms of uh, opportunities to explore in gap years, you know, remember, it, the important thing is not that it has to be in forensic psychology. The important thing is that there's some story that you can, you know, trace. So for example, or that you can make cogently. So for example, for me, you know, me working in like an emotion recognition social psychology lab may not seem super forensic, but I was interested in emotion recognition deficits in children with callous on emotionality, which is kind of the precursor to psychopathy. So that's what I was interested in, right? Uh, in terms of, you know, 
callous and emotionality. But there was no forensic psych lab at my school. So what did I do? I picked something that helped teach me the methodology that I would then want to use in graduate school. So that was the idea. That's much more important. But you can always take a look to be able to see whether or not there happens to be a prison or a jail or something like this that's looking for volunteers for different programs. You know, there are a lot of like pastoral ministries, for example. So one of the churches that I'm involved with, they have one that is in a prison, you know. So there's a lot of different ways to be able to get involved. Uh, is it necessarily going to be in a psych context? Possibly not. When I was an undergraduate, I ended up working in Connecticut for the Connecticut Youth Services Division, uh, which is kind of juvenile detention in terms of, you know, what we used to call it. And the idea is that, like, I would go around and give, like, very simple assessments, not diagnostic assessments or anything like this. Somebody had to go and in person administer these verbal comprehension tests, like math comprehension stuff. So I would go and do that, right? They needed a warm body in the room who knew how to administer the task. And so that's what I did. And I got a lot of great experience out of doing that, Curtis. So you can always explore opportunities like that. But take a look to see whether or not there's anybody in your department right now who's actually doing that kind of work. And maybe you can uh, piggyback off the work that they're doing and see if you can get involved with, uh, with what they're doing, even if it's not at your university. You know, maybe there's somebody in a department at your university, but they're doing stuff kind of outside with colleagues. Maybe they're the co-PI or the co-I, the co-investigator on a grant that's doing stuff where the stuff is mostly based at, you know, another college or university. Fantastic. Still get in touch with them. See if there's anything that you can do. Okay. So a lot of opportunities. Remember to always try to be creative. Always think outside of the box. That is really going to behoove you down the line. All right, my friend, enjoy your day. Thank you everybody for watching. Hit that like button, subscribe to the channel. Lots of love. Talk to you soon. Peace.